My name is Ty Nathan Clark and I'm an abstract painter. Um, I'm also a filmmaker. I produced my first feature documentary a few years ago that actually world premiered at South by Southwest in Austin. So that was fun to premiere in the backyard. Um, I also am a writer and I'm currently working on my first novel that I just got my first editorial edits back for. So I've got a full load right now and I just try to stay creative in every facet of life after a long life of being my own patron and working for other people and finally now being able to paint and create on my own. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a background on myself first um, and kind of weave that narrative of my life and my background in art into what social media has done for me as an artist with my work, with networking, um, with building relationships with our artists from galleries to dealers to museums. So I'm gonna weave a, a lot of different things in. And then at the end, we will also open it up for a lot of questions. And I've also given Sarah permission to interrupt me at any time tonight if we have great questions coming in in the chat um, so that I can really trying to answer and, and keep this two way and not just one way the whole time um, with all of you that are tuning in tonight. So we're excited that you're here to visit us and thank you to the Door Tree Art Center for allowing me to share. So a little background on myself and my journey. Um, I grew up right outside of Lake Tahoe in Northern California up in the mountains in the Sierra Nevadas. And I grew up in love with the arts. My uncle Conway Jiggs Pearson was a world renowned raku artist and potter and also the Dean of the Art Program at UCSB Santa Barbara. So I kind of was able to grow up as a kid with the art world existing. So a lot of us that grew up or, or work in the arts now, the art world may not have existed until we were in college or after. And for me, I had these little sprinkles of it all the time. And so when I started creating, I knew it was something that was in my DNA. Um, I studied studio art and painting at Azusa Pacific University in Southern California. And after school, I learned really fast that all those myths of young art stars that we were all trying to be in art school truly don't exist. Um, they're there, they're the stories we love. We wanna be the Andy Warhols and the Joan Mitchells and the Basquiat's and all these characters, the Helen Frankenthalers um, we, we, we know these legends and in our heads, we feel like that's going to happen to us because we love them so much and they speak to us so much and, and our life is going to be that life. Well, no, you usually end up having to find a job, doing something you don't really like to do sometimes. And for me, that was retail. I needed a job. I needed something I could get easy. And I started working in retail after school and I didn't expect to do it for a long time. I still had those dreams of I'm going to make it in the art world. I'm going to be a painter. Well, my painting started to become less and less as I worked more and more to pay, to get married, to have a place to live. And I had moved to Texas at that time as well. And so I had this whole new culture shock also with having to work for a living and trying to create the culture shock of moving from South, South, Southern California to the Dallas area. Um, so I worked in retail and ended up working my way up with a, a surf and skate company called Quicksilver from California. And I started to learn how to run a business in multiple facets um, over time. And then my wife and I decided we were going to move overseas and open, open a coffee shop in China. And so we did that. And I started to learn how to do business in an international market. So I'm gaining skills that I don't know I'm going to be able to use later on in my life as an artist. My wife and I moved back from China to the States, to the Dallas area again. We lived in Denton actually. And I started looking for jobs there and I found a startup that was a Chinese electronics company that hired me to be their art director and marketing director with no experience because I spoke a little bit of Mandarin. <laughs> so they fell in love with me because I knew some Mandarin and they basically paid me to learn how to do marketing and how to do graphic design to take classes, um, to learn from Google experts, et cetera, et cetera. So I started to learn design, video, marketing, website stuff, SEO. As a job, I'm learning. So I took all those skills, left that business, and my wife and I started a fashion brand. And 
I'm starting to learn public relations and PR and fashion design and all these things. And we toured the country for two years with my fashion line. And all the while, I'm still painting at nights, painting on weekends, painting on holidays and trying to fit in my creative life with a business and these things that I'm doing. And so after a few years, we ended up helping start a outdoor adventure brand in Austin called Kamek. And for about two years, we built a company, raised investment, were a part of a business accelerator in New York where I was able to learn from some mentors who were some of the biggest marketing design, PR people, investors, and CEOs in the US for an entire year. And so for all these years after art school, I'm just building up this foundation of business skills and things that I end up taking with me everywhere I go afterwards and into the art world. And these are things that you don't learn in school, especially art school. You don't learn much about the business aspects of being an artist, that you are your own business. You're learning how to break down all the things you think you know about art and grow and expand and really learn how to create. And most artists have to adapt really quickly when they leave. And there's a lot of artists who are self-taught. And if you're a self-taught artist, you're really having to search out in the world to get information to help you with your career. And for most of us, we're always our own patrons. We support ourselves as artists for a long time until maybe one day we're able to do it full time. But if not, we're still our own patrons and we're creating while we work. So as I said, I'm always painting, I'm always creating. And I'm doing these things, but I was working 60 hours a week building a business and I was losing my mind in the process because deep down in my soul, I'm an artist. I need to create to be me, to be free. I mean, it was one of my goals since, was, since I was a kid is I just want to paint. That's all I want to do. So I'm building other people's brands. I'm creating ideas behind other people's brands. And I'm starting to build people's social media profiles. I'm finding new audiences for these brands trying to get people to buy the products. And I'm all the while I'm neglecting my own audience as I'm painting on the side and painting at nights and on weekends. I learned a ton. So four years into building Kamek in Austin, I knew it was time to walk away and paint full time. And so I did. And this journey has been hard. I think it's been six and a half years since I've been a full-time artist. Um, it's been frustrating. It's been confusing but it's also been the happiest and the most joy-filled time of my life. And I was able to take all these things I've learned and apply them into my studio practice. Sales, management skills, customer service, marketing and PR, publicity, video editing, photo photography, web building, graphic design, budget and finance, all those things. And finally, social media as well. And I brought it all with me. I got so good at building other brands and other people's social media profiles, engaging with their audiences, creating exciting content that other people would wanna see. But honestly, I was scared to death to do it for myself. I was so scared. It's easy to do something for somebody else, but when you're doing it for yourself and you're throwing yourself out there, it's a really intimidating thing. It's really scary. And this really coincides with my first week when I left my job to paint full time, I sat up, I sat in a chair in my studio in front of a blank canvas for a whole week. I couldn't paint. There was so much tension between myself and the wall. And remember, I've been painting nights and weekends and, you know, time that I could fit in when I wasn't with family. But what now I had all the time in the world to create and I couldn't figure out how to do it. I was really scared of what the world was going to think about what I was creating now. And so that's going to really tie into the fear of sharing yourself and being vulnerable with your work in social media as well. So I got really lucky. I ended up going to a Creative Mornings ATX in 2012. And I don't know if all of you know who the author Austin Kleon is, but he's a brilliant artist who has written a couple incredible books. And his book, Steal Like an Artist, had just came out. And Austin was speaking on this book and his process of creating and being vulnerable and sharing him, his self with an audience that's out there that exists. And he shared this quote from Steve Martin that ended up in his next book, Show Your Work. 
And the quote says, be so good that people cannot ignore you. If you focus on getting really good, people will come to you. So you don't really find an audience for your work. An audience will find you. But in order to do that, you have to be findable. And when I heard that quote, I was just going, oh my gosh, like that just kind of took that fear away from me because I know as an artist, you have to be found in order to grow from somebody who just wants to create into the emerging artist world and into the established world. Like there's a trajectory of growth that we'll talk about in a little while. It takes time, but you have to be findable. And the old way to do it was footwork. That's it. That's all you could do. You just go to, you have to meet people. You have to go places. But we have this gift now that is also a curse in technology and social media that we can use to allow an audience to actually discover us without us going in a full search for the audience. So we have to be diligent in putting ourselves out there for people to discover us. And then when, while we're doing that, we can spend all of our time getting really good at our craft. Austin Kleon also says, I love this. It's still like an artist. All the world's a stage. Creative work is a theater and the stage is your studio. The costume, your outfit, your painting clothes, your suit. The props are your materials, your tools, your medium. The script, the script's just plain old time an hour here and an hour there, just time measured out for things to happen. And so I was like, oh man, I love acting, I love film. All of my favorite artists had this persona out in public that may not really be how they are when you meet them in their studio or their gallery. And so I took what he said to heart, the costume is my outfit. So when I paint, I have an outfit, I have my studio jacket, that I paint in, every time I paint, I wear my studio jacket and obviously it's my palette as well. I have my studio pants, I have my old studio shoes because there's nothing cooler than an artist's shoes or boots. I mean, think of Jackson Pollock's boots, they're iconic. There's paint everywhere from him dribbling his paint across them. And so I took what Austin said to heart and I had to make it playful for myself in some way to get over my own nerves of opening up my studio and my life to an audience. At this time, I had my personal Instagram account. I had a Twitter account, I had a Facebook account, I had a YouTube account. My space was long and gone. And they were all personal pages. So it, it wasn't focused on art. It was just focused on my life, you know, from traveling, business trips, sharing beer, whiskeys, wine, travel, uh, books I'm reading, pictures of my niece and nephew, which is a normal social media page that most of us have. And every now and then I would share my art, but, but not that often. So other than my website, I really had no other way for others to see my artwork unless they visited my garage studio came and saw my work at East Austin or West Austin studio tours where I had work up somewhere. And I decided, you know, I'm gonna follow what Austin Cleon advice was and start sharing me. And like I said, it took a while to get comfortable. And my studio has always been pretty private to me. And for a lot of us as artists, our studio is kind of our sanctuary, you know, it's a little private. It's our place where we go to get away and to create and work on our stuff. And so it, it took a little bit of getting over that fear of opening this up for a bigger, a bigger and wider audience than just myself or people that came to see my work when I invited them. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to start with Instagram. Just Instagram. I'm going to put out time and effort every day into one platform. And I'm going to create a routine. And once I got that routine down, then I would add in others. So I started posting myself in the studio. I started posting my work, talking about when I was failing, when I was winning, things I was learning, the entire vulnerable process of struggling to be a studio artist. I took the advice of do good work and share it with people. I put myself out there and hoped an audience would find me. I made work every day. Also knowing it wouldn't be great work yet. I was just beginning a real studio practice, but I shared every second of my story. 
I was now naked on the internet, so to speak. I was allowing myself to be vulnerable and I was out there for everybody to see. There was one thing, and I know I've talked to a lot of young artists about this, is the fear of people stealing our ideas. This, this is something that is really great in the art world. There is a great fear of people stealing our ideas and stealing our work. I read this quote by Howard Aiken. Don't worry about people stealing your ideas. If your ideas are any good, you'll have to ram, ram them down people's throats. And that, that's an awesome quote. And I, I think for me, I felt like, oh man, everybody's going to take this idea. If I try something new, is somebody going to steal it? It's not going to be mine. Well, if the ideas are good, we're still going to have to ram them down people's throats for them to even notice most of the time. But it's going to happen. People are going to steal stuff. That is art. Art is theft. Every idea in art has been used and changed and developed. Sometimes there are new ideas, but that new idea formed from an older idea. That's just the way that art works. And listen, we have control over what we share. This is the beauty of social media. We have absolute control over what we as an artist shares. We don't have to share it all. And we shouldn't. Some of the stuff we do is for us only. It's not for the world. There are certain paintings that I do that I will never show. I won't, I won't even show them in a gallery probably. And there's plenty of work that's just terrible that I paint over and that I redo, that I move on. I mean, we're, we're artists. We create a little bit of great work, hopefully in our life. And there's a lot of work that's leading to that great work. A lot of work. So just be real, be you. I think that's the key. We see the fakers all the time. We see the people who have this persona of greatness and being amazing. And you know, when you watch what they do, their life doesn't really echo that. So to build an engaged and truly invested audience, be real, be vulnerable. So what did I do? I made it a routine. There's a book that I read um, that is called Daily Rituals uh, that goes through one to two pages over the daily rituals of some of the world's greatest thinkers, philosophers, writers, um, scientists, uh, I mean, you name it, and it just goes through their ritual. That's all it is, one to two pages on each person, what time they wake up, when they start working, what that process looks like, when they eat lunch. And it was really good for me because I realized ritual becomes discipline. When you put rituals in your life and in your practice and you do them over a period of time, they become discipline. And I knew with social media, this is now part of my business. I want to sell work. I want to connect with other artists. I need to find an art dealer. I want to find a gallery. So I knew I needed to show my work. So I set up my phone on a tripod and I started filming myself in the studio every day. I just started changing my camera angles as I worked. Now, this wasn't easy. It took a while. There are days I forgot to set my phone up. There are days I hit record and my phone died or I had one boring angle and the lighting was terrible. So there's a lot of learning in this for me. But I set my phone up and I would just record every day. And after I'd finish a painting, I spent some time editing and I'd create a little video. I'd time lapse it and I'd share it with my audience. Well, I started to attract an audience. I put it out there and people started coming. Artists, art lovers, photographers, sculptors, dancers, creative people started showing up. And we were all talking about art. We were just talking about the things that we loved around the arts and it just became a beautiful conversation in the comment feeds, in my DMs all over the place. And some of these people have become some of my closest peers as well, which is incredible. And we'll get into that later too. But for me, this was really massive. I have a lot of friends in the Austin art scene, the DFW art scene, and they're both wonderful scenes. But as we all know, it's not New York or LA, especially for contemporary artists. So there are great scenes within both cities, but they're pretty small compared to New York and LA. And so as my platform began to grow, I knew I had to figure out a way to really expand my reach for art dealers, gallerists, curators, and artists all over the world. I already was connected within the art scenes in multiple cities in Texas, but it's a pretty crowded scene because it is a lot smaller than some of the major cities. And so for me, this has been one of the greatest ways to actually connect within the art world. 
I research and I study the art world daily. I keep up with up and coming curators, new galleries, art fairs, what's going on in the scenes in all the cities. I follow them, I enter in in conversations, I apply for shows and I just discuss art and the backgrounds all within social media. And then when I can finally, unfortunately not this year, get out to LA or New York or Chicago, I set up coffees or studio visits with my new peers and friends. Something I did pretty regularly up until obviously the pandemic hit this year. And for us in a pandemic world, this is really our greatest option to share, uh, to be us, to get involved in the art world. We, it's so tough right now because normally, on a Friday night, if you're in the art world or a Saturday night, you're gonna go to an opening and you're gonna mingle with a ton of other artists, sculptors, photographers. Um, you're gonna go to Alamo Draft House and you're gonna see people outside hanging out that you know from the scene. And with that being absent for artists, this puts us in such an even greater destiny role for ourselves because we're not able to truly engage in that personal networking community that we had a year ago. And so social media is something I truly believe people should, especially artists, should really spend a little more time on right now so that you can not only keep those relationships up, but engage in the art world where you couldn't, where you're not able to do it like you did a year ago. Um, so let's talk about Instagram. It's become one of the most incredible platforms for artists and creators. You have the ability to engage, you have the ability to share, you have the ability to sell, and you have the ability to build an audience for yourself as an artist like never before. There are art sites like Abstract Duke. Now these are all Instagram sites. So if you're writing things down, um, Abstract Duke, um, Abstract Mag, Today's Art Report, Minute 16, and the curators, they have all built audiences that show emerging artists. And there's a ton of them. These are just a few. Um, they are basically curated art forms for the emerging artist. And the guys and gals that have started some of these sites, and there are hundreds of them. That's why I research, because they're popping up every day. They provide a platform that's basically a digital gallery for emerging artists. So by using a hashtag and hashtagging, let's say Abstract Duke, um, can, so Sam, Sam Duplessis, who's the curator um, and an art collector who runs Abstract Duke. He has a hashtag. So you can use the hashtag abstract Duke when you put up a painting or a sculpture or whatever. And he'll go through that hashtag in the evenings and find work that he likes and he'll generally share them sometimes. They're not always gonna get shared and probably most of the time you're not gonna get shared. But what I'm letting you know is study these sites, find them and we'll go through that in a minute because if they do share your piece, it, you have all these other artists that follow them religiously, they're gonna now connect with you. Um, and you never know, I ended up getting my first museum show at the Delaware Contemporary Museum this year because of Sam, who's the curator that runs that feed. Um, so there are lots of options to connect outside of our normal sit down and have coffee, go to art shows um, experience that we don't have right now. Um, it's really important for us to put time into our platforms. But is it really? I think that's the question I get from a lot of artists. When I say, man, start putting more time into your Instagram. You could really garner some people, some attention, connect, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I just, do I really need to do it? It really depends. If you're in, if you're in New York or LA and you're running in art circles and you're involved in everything that's happening on a regular basis, maybe not. But if you're trying to find your way, which I'm pretty sure most of us on here are trying to find our way in this insane world of the emerging, emerging artists. This is the most compacted, no rules, no instructions, 
so many people vying for space world in the art world. Yes, you need a social media platform that you're engaged in because of that reason. This is a way for you as an emerging artist to get past your studio. And I think, I, I know a lot of artists that are stuck in their studio. Um, and I'm not saying stuck as far as they're always in there because we want to be in our studio all the time, as far as sharing their studio with an audience. Um, if nobody knows who you are, if nobody sees your work and all you're doing is creating work, you're going to be 80 years old and creating work. And you're going to have a lot of people that have no idea what your, look, your work looks like and what your voice sounds like. And I think that's the biggest thing for me in the art world is there are so many beautiful voices that need to be heard through their mediums, but there's not enough information. There's not enough coaching. There's not enough instruction um, or mentorship that helps young emerging artists figure out a path to success, figure out a path to get their voice out there. And there's a really great statement by Robin Sloan, who um, she writes about stock and flow, and it's an economic concept. And she's adapted this concept into a metaphor for social media. So stock and flow. Flow is the feed. I'm going to put this in the chat too, so that people can copy it real quick. Stock and flow is an economic concept that she's adapted for social media. Flow is the feed, the posts and all the tweets and all the things that we share on our social media platform. It's that stream of daily and sub daily updates that remind us that you exist. Now stock, on the other hand, stock is the durable stuff. It's all the content we, we produce that's as interesting in two months or two years as it is today. I think that's a great statement right there. It's what people discover via search. It's what spreads slowly but surely, building fans over time. The magic formula is to maintain your flow while working on your stock in the background. And I think when you think about a portfolio, social media echoes as a portfolio for your work as well. Some artists don't have the skills to build a website. There are plenty of free and easy website builders out there, but it's intimidating. Social media can be that website for you. Instagram can be that portfolio for you. Um, we're documentarians of what we do, each of us. So as artists, we are documenting our own story regularly in our work, in our artwork. It's a documentary about us, but we have the ability to record our stories through social media as well. And I love personally that I have a source that I can go back to and look at where I was a year or two years or three years ago in my work. That's really easy to do. All the videos that I started recording years ago in my studio and sharing, I realized two years into this routine that I now had an encyclopedia of two years of past work. And so when I was working on a painting and I'd go, why can I not replicate this brush stroke or this texture that I did last year I could go back in my video now because I had a routine for social media. I now could go back in this video and find what I did on that last painting and go, oh, that's how I did it. I used painting butter. I wasn't using, you know, whatever. And so for me, I love having the ability to have my own encyclopedia as well. I can go back and go, oh, wow, I was really awful two years ago. I cannot believe I was painting that. And then look at my work today and go, at least I know that I've improved in my craft. <laughs> um, it becomes a networking tool. And I'm in no way saying that Instagram is a sole networking tool. We need to be out meeting other artists, going to shows, visiting studios and galleries in the old fashioned way. We have to be, that is, that is the sole heart of the art world meeting people at shows, meeting people at muse museums, talking to, here, here's a story for you. I get in trouble at museums all the time. Um, and this is why I, I take on the role of an educator in an art museum. And I think it's because I'm so excited when somebody else gets excited about a painting that I love that I wanna now enter in a conversation and educate them on that artist and that piece. So I'm at the Broad 
a couple years ago um, in LA and I'm in the Cy Twombly room and Cy is one of my favorite artists and inspirations and there is a couple discussing a Cy Twombly piece and their dates are off um, the dates and the order of the work are off and a few stories they were sharing were a little off and so I of course interjected myself friendly and was sharing with them about the piece and they walked away didn't want to hear it and then at other times I just gather people around and become the tour guide and start sharing my favorite story about this uh, William de Kooning piece and why it's so important and um, so th that's what drives the art world like those moments are the things that make this world that we all love and we're ingrained in special is that interpersonal connection between the work and the viewer and the three viewers and the work and um, so social media is our backup it's your backup support so just imagine it's your backpack that's on your back and wherever you go you have the ability to bring your work with you um, so I definitely, I'm gonna go into a few rules and I'll go slow. And there may be some questions here too, Sarah, as I go into kind of, the, and these are my personal rules um, and what has been successful for me. So I, I don't think that it's not gonna work the same for everybody, um, but I do think some of these rules will help. Uh, I don't know why some people get tons of followers and some people don't. That's really a question that's hard to, to grasp, but I do feel that if you follow some of these rules and you're really, how can I say, and you're, you put a lot of emphasis on some of these things, you will attract people and you will attract an audience. And if not that, you'll attract peers. And honestly, peers are the greatest thing. I told you before, like some of my best friends in the art world now are all people I met on Instagram. Um, New York, uh, Poland, Germany, Budapest, uh, Houston, California, uh, Canada. I mean, they're all over the world and we talk on a regular basis. Some of us have done, you know, my friend Ty and I in, in LA, we've done a shared Instagram live feed just discussing where we're at and how our work's going for ours to watch. It's like, it's just so special. Those are things you normally do in the galleries, but you can't do them this year. So you got to find those ways that you can engage others with what you're doing and also celebrate the joys that, and the frustrations they're having um, during this time as well. So rule number one, um, don't put up crappy pictures of your art. Don't, there is no, and this is a career thing, artists. This is a career lesson here. There is no bigger turnoff for a gallery, for a dealer, for a curator or even another artist than terrible photos of artwork. We all have cell phones today. This little phone takes really good pictures. So there are no excuses anymore. Find a wall in your garage, find an empty wall in your house or a bedroom, find one that you can clear off, make that wall your photo wall. That's the wall that is for me to put a painting and take a picture on, nothing else. There's no marks, there's no holes, it's not distracting. Look it up, research, and we're gonna talk about research later. Research how to photo artwork. The internet, as we know, is a wealth of knowledge. Research how to photograph artwork. You can edit it in Photoshop. You can download free photo editing apps on your phone like Visco or Snapseed, make it look as close to the original colors as possible. Figure it out. You can get real creative with lighting. You can turn a lamp on the side. You can have somebody hold a lamp behind you that's putting light on the picture. If you, if you can't afford to buy lights, there are cheap lights on Amazon for photographing artwork that are not too expensive that you can find. Um, show the full image and then share details of that image, of that artwork. People love details. When I see a, an artist share a painting, oh, I wanna get up in there. I wanna get really close. I wanna see the texture. I wanna see the canvas poking through. I wanna find how does that brush mark hit the negative space? Like I, I, those details are so great. If you go to my last post on my Instagram page that I put up today, I have a picture of the painting and then I have, I think, 10 slides of details. So I put that up so you guys could go look at it and kind of see what I'm saying as well. Um, 
share the scale, share the title, share the medium and the date that you created it. Treat it like it's showing in a gallery. Have, you, you're prideful about your work. You love your work. Treat it that way when you share it on social media. Treat it like you are showing work in a gallery. And I'll say the same for studio photos. We're all artists. We take self-portraits. We, we invented the selfie, artists did. So nobody can take that away from us. We own it. We created it. We painted ourselves for centuries. We've taken pictures of ourselves in studios um, and we still do it. And honestly, artists love it because some of our favorite memories of our favorite artists, I mean, think of the picture of Helen Frankenthaler doing a 40 foot canvas and pushing that bucket of paint across the canvas in three tones. Like that's one of the most epic studio photos there is. Jackson Pollock in the barn painting. I mean, you have these images in our minds from art school or studying art or watching art documentaries of artists in their studios. We love to see them. We love to share them. And honestly, art lovers love them too because it lets you in. It's letting the audience in to where you are and where you create. So those pictures should be good as well. You can take a good picture and you can edit it well on your phone. This one's the hard one. Post every day if you can. Why? Because a small percentage of your followers are actually going to see your posts. And if you want to reach new people, you have to post every day. You want your art to go far and wide. Posting every day, it enhances your chances in the crazy, stupid Instagram algorithm that none of us will ever understand. So, if you don't paste every day, your photo gets lost in the feed of everybody else that's looking through photos. And it only usually shows regularly to those that look at your feed regularly. So the more you post, the more opportunity you have in the Instagram photo lottery for your picture to go ahead and hit. Use hashtags. I can't emphasize this enough. And I know somebody just said that everyone searches hashtags every day. Yes, that's where I'm going right now. I cannot emphasize, ha emphasize hashtags enough. The only way you will be discovered by people who are not in your audience are by utilizing hashtags. Unless you get shared on another site like an Abstract Duke or today's art, another curated art site that you've tagged and they share your photo. Hashtags are the only way you're going to be discovered. Why? Because people are going through hashtag abstract art, hashtag uh, minimal abstraction. There are millions of hashtags out there. People scroll through them daily and look for new feeds and new artists. I follow hashtags on Instagram because you can follow hashtags just like you follow a person's account. I have maybe 50 hashtags that I follow because I want to find new art and new artists. Um, use them. I have, I have on my little notes on my iPhone, I have a list of probably 300 to 400 hashtags. I have them all grouped into groups of 15 to 25. And then I have them uh, art video, if I'm sharing an art video, um, painting, gallery, I have a whole list. And I spent time, I spent time researching hashtags. I spent time looking, what fits my work? What fits my feed and who I am as an artist the most? I shouldn't be painting, I shouldn't be posting hashtag portrait photography if I'm an abstract expressionist. Like it does me no good. So use hashtags. I know people think they look ugly. I don't like them. There are tricks to hide them in your feed. Go to your first comment, do five little dashes and then put your hashtags and it'll hide the hashtags in your post. You won't see them. People won't see them on your post. So use them. You want to be discovered. Answer the comments. Oh, so many people don't answer comments. And you know what's going to happen when you don't answer somebody's comments? They're going to stop following you. You're not engaging with them. Like the reason we're doing this as artists is to engage with an audience. Why? When you do that small work sale from your website, Guess who's going to buy the $102 to 
studies on paper, random audience people who just love your work. I, it happens to me all the time. I have this audience and my most of them cannot afford one of my paintings, but I do small work things and studies that I end up putting up on Instagram for a hundred or $200 every now and then. And those are the people that get them. I want people to have original artwork from the artists that they love. And most of my artist friends do the same thing because they're engaging with us. We should give them a gift sometimes. We should give them the ability to have original work on their wall that really means something to them. And so it takes time. Oh, sometimes I'll have to sit on the couch for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, just answering comments at night when I put a show on or something. It takes time, but do it. You want to engage your audience. They are important. Um, ask questions. This is another great way to engage the audience to actually talk with you. Use art quotes. Actually tell a story. You get to discuss your work here in this avenue. That's something that not a, lot of, not a lot of artists get the opportunity to discuss their work. So this is your opportunity to discuss your work and bring others into your studio. There's something really cool about being invited into another person's sanctuary or their studio. Um, I know I was out in LA a few years ago to visit a, an artist. I was in a, a post-grad cohort out in LA and there's an artist that I follow. Um, his name's Johnny Cheatwood, um, has just been exploding internationally in the emerging art world. He's incredible. And we've never met in person, but I sent him a message, said, I'm in LA. I'm going to be museum and gallery hopping the next few days. Um, can I come see your studio? And he said, absolutely. So I got to go visit Johnny in person. And there's something, and I'm sure it's this way for most of us, when you cross cross that threshold into another artist's space, there's just something really special about that. And I really feel we can echo that with our social media feeds. It's not the same thing, but I think we can echo a little bit of that. And really, especially to people who are art fans and who just love art, they're not just artists. That's the most important part of the art world right there because that's what buys work. That's what collects work and keeps those of us going on a regular basis, our art lovers and art fans. They're the ones that sell tickets. They're the ones that give donations to their favorite, you know, artist centers in Austin, like the art lovers. It's those people that, that drive us. And that also, that's our audience. So, I mean, I, I'm constantly studying my favorite artists in history. And I'll tell you what, if I had the ability to watch them work and grow on Instagram today, I would be in absolute heaven. If I could watch Helen Frankenthaler, Joan Mitchell, Anthony Tapez, Cy Twombly, Agnes Martin, if I could engage with them today, I mean, I, I'd be all over it. I do that now with my contemporaries, um, Glenn Lejean to Bisa Butler, um, Rashid Johnson, Theaster Gates. Um, I'm constantly engaging and even if they don't engage back all the time sometimes they do that feels pretty darn good that's me the, when when one of my contemporaries that I look up to actually responds to me it, it makes my whole week so when you have an audience as an emerging artist you have those people that are following you that really do look up to your work really do look up to the words that you say so answer them, talk with them, engage with them. Um, I'm constantly on my Instagram direct messages, engaging with people who have comments about medium and texture and supplies and tools. I mean, everything, resources. Um, so that I'm just letting you know I'm an open book. So feel free to reach out with questions after this too. So here's a big one. Don't be a jerk. Please don't be a jerk. Handle criticism well. This is a key as an artist. Handle criticism well. It's something you have to learn because it's very, very hard because we always feel like we're better than we actually are. And that is a good trait to have because that makes you keep working and keep grinding. But we have to handle criticism well. And listen, people love art and people hate art. So be ready for the trolls. Be ready for the jerks. You can ignore them. 
You can delete their comment because somebody at some time is going to be nasty and there's no need to return with the fight. This world needs more love and joy and uh, than anything right now. So I usually let the comments stay. <clears throat> if I get ripped to shreds, I, I don't delete it. I leave it. Um, why? Because it's, it's criticism. If I'm in a gallery and I'm showing work to a curator and there's a bunch of people in the room and they don't like my piece and they tell me they don't like it, I can't escape that moment. I have to deal with it. You know, I, it may be my favorite piece in the entire body of work, but if the curator doesn't think it can sell to his audience or if they just don't like it and everybody hears it, I need to accept that. I need to take it back and think about it. So a lot of times my followers will end up replying and defending me. Um, usually because I'm nice in return, my followers usually don't defend with anything nasty. Um, and sometimes I spend a lot of time thanking them for the enormous amount of time they spent studying my work because they have to put time in to put so much Beatrol into their posts that they had to have spent time swallowing everything that I, that I put out there for them to see. And then I let them know that if I'm ever in town, wherever they live, I'd love to take them out for coffee or buy them a beer and hear their story. Usually that post disappears or the person disappears. Um, or a lot of times they've even apologized for being a jerk and said they're just having a bad day. So, so don't be a jerk. Be nice. Um, find your voice. Shout it from the rooftops and keep doing it until the people that are looking for you find you. That's from Dan Harmon. I love that. Don't stop. Keep doing it. There is an audience out there for you. There literally is. We sometimes, we're just weird in the art world. Like who knows why certain people love certain artwork? We have no idea. There's no answer to it. Some people hate abstraction with a passion, they can't even swallow it. Some people hate realism so much, they can't swallow it. Like minimalist sculpture, contemporary sculpture. I mean, people hate things and they love things. So there is an audience that's gonna love what you do. If you do it well, you make it look really good. I'm talking about your photographs, not your work, your photographs, make it look good. Don't just put up a dark picture of a painting in the corner that doesn't do anything to draw any viewership's eyes and then engage those people. They'll find you, I promise you. It could be 100 people, it could be 40 people. The 40 people is an audience that may buy work sometime, and that's huge. So that was Instagram. I'm going to move on to Twitter. Do we have any Instagram questions to answer? There was a, a few, Ty. Um, yeah. Somebody was asking a little bit about the balance of like posting art or personal things or yeah. selfies. You know, I decided when I was going to just make my art, my art platform, that that's all it is. Now, that was before Instagram stories. So I use Instagram stories to put more um, personal things in at times. So if I'm traveling with my wife and we're having a good dinner, I may share a story there. But honestly, my Instagram is 100% art. I, I made a business decision. So we'll put it at that. As an artist, this is a business. You, you are doing every form of a business that a corporation hires multiple positions for. So you have to look at yourself as the CEO the COO, the CFO, the marketing director, the art director, the social media manager, the customer service representative, the website, does it, you know, all those things, they're now wrapped up into you. So I, I made a business decision and made Instagram 100% for art. And so um, stories I'll share every now and then, but if I wanted to do a personal, you know, page, I'd probably just set up a separate one that just my close friends and family could follow. Um, Man, boosted Instagrams, you're just playing with fire. Um, so I know people that have done it. I've done it for businesses, um, for marketing multiple products and things. There's a risk involved with that. And that is number one, not getting a real audience um, that are true art lovers and love your work. 
um, and you have the chance of Instagram shut you down. So I'd hate to see anybody put in tons of time and work to build up an audience. And then all of a sudden you're, you get shut down. Um, so I'll answer Sarah's question. If you're working on a project that could exist on its own or as a defined piece, should we create a separate Instagram account? It's up to you. Um, I, I create in bodies of work. So usually every body of work I create has, you know, 15 to 25 pieces that fit within a theme. Um, and so I usually, you know, we'll talk about me leading up to this new body of work. And I kind of look at that as the launching platform for what's going to come. Um, so, you know, Sarah, you're by doing that, you're just creating more work for yourself too. you know, by managing multiple platforms for multiple things. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm not saying you can't do it. It all depends on your time and how much you want to put in. So if you're doing a specific work um, and a specific project, you could. I don't see many people doing that. So maybe that's a new thing that's going to garner a bunch of attention. So I always say experiment and fail well. So Can I ask another question involved, yeah. related to that? Like I'm fortunate to be working with the Doherty Art Center on kind of a public art piece um, where it'll be my photography, but um, people from the community will be able to nominate others to have their portraits made. And then it'll be kind of like this hopefully online community um, of essential workers. And so I'm just like trying to figure out if that's me or if that's something else altogether connected to me. And so I'm a little bit intimidated on how to kind of launch yeah. this. So <laughs> I'll say a number of things. I don't have like a, a definite answer for you, but I'll say a few things. So there are a few of the big art curator sites out there on Instagram that have the 100,000, you know, uh, followers and they're just curating emerging art and paintings that are run by artists. So they have their own art feed, but they're also building this, you know, massive following here. So, and, and what I was going to say before you came on was I could see something like what you're saying happen for a public arts piece. Like, I feel like that is the one arena where that could work well in. Same for if somebody's a filmmaker, right? And they're gonna, their new film's gonna come out. They're not gonna do all of their new film stuff just on their personal site. They're gonna actually build out a site for their film um, on Instagram. So I think it's definitely something to, to look at and also to talk to the people that you're working with the project on um, and see what they think about it as well. Cause it could be a really cool collaborative thing um, for a public works project, I think. Um, Okay, I'm gonna move on. Let's, I'm gonna finish this. Best way to get the most out of an opportunity when you're hired by a group with a big following. I'm not sure I understand that. Put in the chat there, um, Alexandra, um, a little bit more of a description on what you're saying and I'll, and I'll get to it when I see it pop up. Um, okay, I'm gonna move on to Twitter. Do you need it? Not really. Can it help you? Sure. Most of the art critics in the world are very active on Twitter. That is the only reason I'm on Twitter. So I spent a lot of time on Twitter in the past. I didn't really see any growth art-wise. Nothing was really helping as far as art world connections, galleries, dealers. They were all flooding to Instagram at the time. I was putting a lot of time into trying to build Twitter out. But this is the one, number one reason why you should be on Twitter. Jerry Saltz, who is the Pulitzer Prize winning art critic. And he is active, 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 active on Twitter. He is always sharing his thoughts. He's always giving advice to emerging artists. And he is always engaging with his followers. He is a 100% blast. And so if you're going to be on Twitter, reasons like that are where to spend your time. You can share your work. You can continue to just try to build an audience through sharing your work and doing things. But there are also little things on these platforms that maybe have a little more gravitas in their areas than others. And so... I have engaged with Jerry so many times over the last few years, it's incredible. 
because he usually responds. There are times where he can't because he may have 10,000 comments <laughs> and there's no way Jerry's gonna spend his whole day going through all the comments, but he does respond and you will get responses from him. And he loves talking about emerging artists and what you need to do to make it and how hard it is. Um, so, <laughs> Wells, if you're conservative, you won't like Jerry, probably not. Um, but you're, if you're a conservative in the art world, if you're a liberal in the art world, we're all in the art world. There are certain people that you may not like. There are certain people whose views you may disagree with. But if you're gonna be in the art world, you need to learn to be in the art world. And that means meeting lots of different people from lots of different backgrounds, from lots of different views on life. And it also means learning to adapt, learning to adjust, and learning to learn. You need to learn about other people before judging them. And some people are shock heavy in the art world, but they may have the best information that you could ever get to advance your career. So all I'm saying is you can learn in any situation in life and you can learn to love people in any situ in situation in life, no matter where they stand. And I think that's where as artists, we have always done a great job of finding those ways to do those things. Um, that's all I have on Twitter because I just don't think it's that important unless you just wanna get yelled at politically on a regular basis, if you're into that. Um, so somebody did what ask I, how you spelled, uh, how you spelled Jerry's last name. Uh, S-A-L-T-Z, Saltz. Um, every time one of my supervisors retweets me, I gain 500 followers and our follower base is incredibly enthusiastic. How should I target our supporter base to best in, boost my engagement and my following? Well, I mean, if your supervisor obviously has a lot of sway and a lot of uh, engagement. Um, I mean, the best way, I mean, so I'll go here. Video is the number one best way to engage people. So the engagement rate on Instagram for video is so much more ridiculously higher than a post. Um, and I will say the same thing on Twitter. So I, like I said before, experiment, 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 fail well, try again, experiment. Everybody's supporter base reacts differently. So what I do may not work for your supporter base. You have to find those things that your supporter base truly, truly loves and is invested in and start playing with some video options, but leave a question at the end. If you don't leave a question at the end, you're just gonna get a like, you know, a thumbs up or a like on the post. Ask people to repost or retweet. Ask people to share their thoughts. Um, People will engage if you give them an opportunity to, but if you just put it out there and that's all there is, most people probably won't engage. And, and this is something Jerry Saltz is absolutely brilliant at. He's always getting people to engage in funny ways, um, in serious ways across the board. So um, just keep, just throw some stuff out there, mess with different options, but leave a question so that they have to respond with an answer. Um, one of my favorite, social media networks is Ello, E-L-L-O. Um, it started out, I can't remember how many years ago, as the anti-social network, anti-social media network. And it has transformed into a social network for artists. This is primary, and it's done fantastically well. Usually you, you read social media for artists site comes up and it's pretty corny, they're pretty bad. This one is legitimate. Um, they literally transformed into an artist network. And the focal point of the network is art and design. They allow you opportunities to collaborate with other artists. So there's actual collaborate button. You can click on the top of your profile so that other artists know you want to collaborate. Um, they have juried competitions for creatives um, that are a lot of brands and film studios are now using. So on the front page, you can look through um, creative competitions. So let's just say Warner Brothers um, with the new Wonder Woman film will put out a call for poster designs. 
and that's how they will choose the person to create the poster for the new Wonder Woman. Um, so if you're a designer um, or if you're a creative that dabbles in design, there are opportunities to get paid um, and there are opportunities for magazine juried competitions and other things. Um, so I use it primarily as another place to share my paintings and to be inspired by other artists. Um, so it's a great option for connecting with other artists and designers. And again, putting your work out there for a new audience. Um, YouTube, this is where I spend the other half of my time, Instagram and YouTube. Multiple reasons. Number one, research. Number two, how-to videos. Number three, the MoMA New York painting lessons and classes. I've created playlists of catalog, documentaries, short interviews, lectures from my favorite artists, current artists, legendary artists. I have folders of all kinds of goodies, classes, the interviews, instructional videos for master painters, um, how to use different mediums and materials that's just for learning. So this is me just using a social media network to learn and to further my own personal education. And I, I had a YouTube account for years, like most of us have a YouTube account. We use it to watch viral videos and laugh um, or watch music videos. I would mess around and make little short films, splicing together found footage. And we're talking like 15 years ago. Um, I decided to start um, ACL concerts from what I'd film with a GoPro at ACL, I'd put them up. Um, and when I started creating my little videos on Instagram, when I started putting time into Instagram, I started to post them on YouTube as well. Um, so I'd use my same description from Instagram, copy and paste it. So I'm not doubling up my time and efforts. All of a sudden I'm getting tens, 20,000s of views on my videos on YouTube. And people started asking questions and about my process and materials. So again, this other network, none of these people are following me on Instagram. So it's a whole new audience. It's not the same audience as Instagram. This is a whole new group of people that are now engaging my work and what I'm doing. Um, and because I have videos up of, of specific pieces and kind of cataloged, I'm also able to use these links to send to galleries, dealers, and curators who inquire about my process when they were showing my work to sell a piece. So it's worked as an accompanied basically portfolio when my dealers or gallerists are showing work to a client and they've watched the video and they know my process. What are these brush strokes? What materials is he using? Okay, yeah, in the description I have that I use graphite, Conte crayon, acrylic, um, whatever. But now they can go in because they've watched me create the piece and share with that client this is exactly how that piece was created. So it's become a great tool for me um, with them as well. They have insight to my studio pro process and how I create my work. And remember, I didn't start out as a pro in this at all. I taught myself. When it comes to video and video editing, I use my phone, I film with my phone. Now I've invested in a good camera for photographing my artwork, but for video, I use my phone. And I taught myself how to edit. I record at the highest settings on my phone and I've watched countless hours of YouTube instructional videos on editing video. I cannot, I'm 14 year old kids have taught me more in my lifetime on editing video than anybody else. And so I learned Adobe Premiere, um, Apple Final Cut Pro inside and out over the years. And this is also, so I'm gonna, this is for all the artists out there because we are our own patrons, we work second, third jobs. Sometimes we do little odd jobs, it depends. Because of me learning these things, it's gotten me small jobs over the years, editing and creating video content for brands and companies and nonprofits. So even though I'm full-time in the art world, I'm still my own patron. So I still at times have to make money outside of art because you don't sell a ton of art. You realize that when you're full-time in the art world, you're not selling 50 paintings a year. You're selling a few paintings a year that help pay for you to paint the next year. Um, so YouTube is great for 
for connecting and also for learning. So use it, artists, use it. If you get to a thousand subscribers on YouTube and you get to 4,000 hours watched of your videos, you can actually make money off of your content on YouTube as well. So I'm not there yet. I'm trying to get there. I think I'm at 3,800 hours total watch this year from other people. So 200 more hours watched and I can make money off of my art videos. Um, so obviously there are lots of other social media options out there for us, lots. You have TikTok um, that I don't use that can push your work out to new audiences. I think you can be really creative on there with how-to videos. Um, and I know there are some artists that have some really great um, instructional videos on TikTok that have gotten a lot of, a lot of, uh, a big audience to them. Um, Pinterest, um, I primarily just use that for inspiration because there's a lot of great art stuff on Pinterest. Um, I do share my own work on a few boards. Um, and you can use any of those. But my suggestion is find one or two and become a master at the routine with them. Because as artists, these things just suck for us because we want to be painting. We want to be taking photographs. We want to be in the dark room or at our computer editing our photos. We want to be at the foundry pouring bronze um, and building our sculptures. Um, if we're dancers, we want to be in the studio dancing and working on new routines. Um, if we're an actor or an actress, we want to be rehearsing and we don't want to spend time on our phones or at the computer any more than we have to. So that's why I'm saying use one or two. Um, use one or two of them, master them, and then you can do more. Because once you get good, you can copy and paste into the other ones. Um, and for a if you're a fine artist, I would 100% suggest Instagram be your primary source if you're a visual artist. At least make it your focus till you have a good routine. Um, Etsy. Marin asked about Etsy. Um, I've sold some work on Etsy, small, small pieces. Um, it can be good. It's just how much time, it's really just a shopping cart, you know, so you're not gonna build a huge audience. You may sell some work here and there. And I know some people who have literally made a living off of illustration on Etsy. Um, there are people making six figures a year on eight by 10 illustrations. And they're great illustrators, they're incredible. And that's, geez Louise, that's amazing. Are you kidding me? Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I throw Etsy, it's more of a shopping cart. So you're really there just to sell. Um, so art, art is hard, you guys. It's very, very hard and it's very slow. So take these words to heart. Art is a long game. Trust me, I'm 46 years old. It is a long game. So you can count. I talked about art stars early on when I left school. I had that dream of being, you know, as a, as a guy, we're always like, I'm going to be the next Basquiat, you know, and I was in art school in the 90s. So Julian Schnabel's Basquiat film had just come out and all of us in art school, um, I dressed like John michel I was doing my own same old graffiti around campus. Um, I, I kind of thought I was the mix between Morrissey and Jean-Michel Basquiat. So, but if you look at it, you guys, how many of us can actually count the number of art stars on our hands? That's about all we can count. We can't get much further than maybe some of us, we can count all the art stars in the history of art on one hand or maybe two hands. Art is a long game. For some reason, this myth has been placed into our heads that if you don't make it an art when you're young, that you're never gonna make it. And I will tell you the percentage of artists over 50 is much higher than the percentage of artists in their 20s that are working, selling artists in the art world, painting, creating full time. It's a long game. They've worked their jobs, they've done their four jobs, They've gotten to the point where finally they have two galleries they can depend on, one dealer they can depend on because they've put the time in. Most of the art world burns out, moves on, stops creating because life gets tough. In my graduating class at Azusa Pacific University, there are three of us in the art world. One is a well-known art critic and author. 
um, and a Dean of an Art program in California, Dr. James Dacian. The other one works for him as a professor there and as a sculptor, Dave Carlson in California. That's three of us. I think we had 250 in our graduating in our class, art class. So everyone else tried, 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 but just couldn't hold on. And life, trust me, as an artist, life catches up faster than you could ever think when you stop creating. Next thing you know, it's 30 years down the road and you go, man, I haven't painted. I've talked to so many artists who have said, oh, I wish I was painting again. And I'm always telling them, do it. Please put a canvas in your bathroom floor and start painting. Please, you need it. So it's tough. The people who last have the discipline and an incredible routine. Uh, Mark Bradford's routine and discipline for creating is, oh, and he has quotes about whether he's sick, he's throwing up, can't walk, he goes in the studio to work. Um, Chuck Close said, uh, inspiration is for amateurs. Um, us professionals just get up and go to work. So if you're waiting for inspiration, it only comes every now and then. We got to just work. Um, so as an artist, we know there's a business side to our work in the art world. You have to adapt. You have to learn to do things you don't like doing. So please take that to heart. You have to learn to do things you don't like doing if you want to keep creating for a long time. So think of yourself as a business. Uh, I know, oh gosh, that's the last thing we want to hear as artists is that my art's a business because it makes you feel like a sellout. Well, uh, read Ninth Street Women. If you read any book this year, read Ninth Street Women. Um, and it tells the stories of, of, of my heroes in the post-war abstract art world. Um, Agnes Martin, Grace Hartigan, um, Helen Frankenthaler, Joan Mitchell. So it's about all the Ninth Street women back then. You'll see how serious they start taking art as a business as they get older. Um, after they've starved too long, <laughs> after they've frozen with no heat in their apartments for too long, they realize the importance of art being a business because they want to do it the rest of their life. They want to do it their entire life. So Social media is one of those things for us today as an artist. I hate saying that, but it really is. But it's actually, a, it's a great thing. So it can be a val valuable asset for your career, very, for your network and for your inspiration. So I will say, use it, have fun with it. Don't let it be a pain. Don't let it be a pain in your butt. Use it, figure out a way to have fun with it. I had to create my own persona in the studio with my studio suit and clothes and and basically acted you know I had to become when I go in the studio I'm now Ty Nathan Clark the artist you know when I walk in the house I'm just I'm Ty Clark I'm a husband uh, I'm an uncle I'm a friend but when I go in my studio I'm Ty Nathan Clark the artist 100% of the time um, and that's my place to be so have fun with it and be you like be yourself engage with people, talk with people. Um, yeah, let's, let's do some questions. Let's do Q and A time. Okay. I've been keeping track of some of them. Um, okay. first one, how do you feel about TikTok or reels on Instagram? Yeah. I mean, I haven't, I've just started messing with reels, which is basically TikTok for Instagram. Um, same exact, uh, layout, same exact options as TikTok is, you know, I haven't seen a huge engagement increase for myself, but I know anytime Instagram puts out a new option, they are going to sync their algorithm into that option. So when they started IGTV, um, which allows for longer videos that you can also watch in a landscape mode rather than a vertical mode, um, they put so much of their algorithm into the IGTV that I only focused on that. I put all my time into that because you could share it to your feed as well. Um, and I was getting tens of thousands of views every IGTV I put up. So when I post video now to Instagram, I only, up, I only do the IGTV option. And then there's a button that says share on your feed. And 
That way I'm not uploading video to my actual feed. I'm using the IGTV method and the engagement is double. Um, Reels, it's so brand new. I'm sure there's going to be something that's going to explode on it, but be the first artist that explodes with it. Get creative, have fun. Be that first person that makes everybody else start doing what you're doing. All right, another question was, um, what about scheduling things um, and using like Hootsuite or using uh, Facebook Creator Studio to schedule posts? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. If, I mean, see, this, this is the hardest part when you start out is you, you may start out and your routine goes for two weeks and then you forget for two weeks. And what happens in that time is the people that are kind of interested and start following, they'll fall off, you'll lose them. So if you need to schedule just for your own routine to make sure that you're doing it, yeah, Hootsuite, um, Facebook schedule. I mean, there's plenty of different, there's a lot of free options. There's a lot of paid options. Um, I know with Instagram, most places, there are a lot of those that don't allow you to actually, there's limitations on what you can do in some of those with Instagram than others. Um, but yes, I mean, gosh, having a whole week planned out on a Sunday where you're just able to have, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday posted for you without having to worry about it. You know, it'll take you a little time on Sunday to put, you know, really put an effort forward. But man, if you need scheduling, that's a phenomenal option. All right. Um, somebody was asking if you have a platform recommendation for writers. Oh, for writers, man. I mean, yes, in Instagram for sure, but you got to go find the writers. That's, that's the thing. So um, for me as a writer, I've, you know, I just got my first editorial notes and my first fully edited manuscript back from my editor two weeks ago. Um, I'll be starting tomorrow on that. Um, I'm just starting that process to find writers and authors. And the challenge for me is my platform isn't a writing platform. Um, so I'm trying to find an audience that loves to read art books and books on music, things that I talk about in my feed regularly, which are art and music that will bring an audience in. So, I mean, I know Facebook has some great groups for artists that are great to join in on. Um, I use, for writers, I use Pro Writing Aid, um, which is an artificial intelligent editor um, that ha has monthly and yearly subscriptions. It basically is like having an editor sitting next to me while I'm writing um, because it edits in real time um, and gives you suggestions. And they have some things on their blog, Pro Writing Aid, for artists to connect on. Um, so, I mean, with, with any creative uh, endeavor, so whether you're a writer, a dancer, a photographer, a singer, an actor, or an actress, um, or just a visual artist, it's really going to be how much research you do in trying to figure out where you can find an audience, or actually where you, an audience can find you. So hashtags, obviously I covered is a big one. Um, start following hashtags for writing. Um, there are plenty of hashtag search uh, websites out there. So you can just type in uh, in Google most popular hashtags for new authors or for writers. And then you can go through and find those and they'll usually list the numbers like 10 million, 100 million. I would suggest finding ones that have 10,000 to 50,000 within those. And those tend to be the more engaged audiences for easier connection. Um, so. All right, this is kind of along the same lines, but this is the only other question that I saw that we maybe didn't get answered was um, uh, tying in promoting a blog on Instagram. Yeah, um, I mean, I, yeah. So there are plenty of options. So obviously you have, you have your URL that you can put your one URL in your Instagram um, profile. Um, I use Linktree, which enables me to put multiple links within that one URL. So when somebody clicks on it, it'll open a page and there will be like four or five URLs that they can click on. So if I am, let's say I put up a blog post, 
um, and I really want people to read it. I'll usually do a post um, and then I will write, a, you know, in my description for my post, what my blog says that they can view my URL and my profile um, and click that link and go to my blog. And then I'll do a few stories as well because I can bring some video into it um, to draw people out. So that's for anything. If you're trying to sell, you know, some small works, um, if you were just featured um, in a theater play and it's online, like whatever it is that you're connected with, use that, change that URL out whenever you need to. I change it regularly. It's not always my website. Sometimes I'm like, did you guys read Jerry's article, Jerry Salt's article in Vulture? Here's the link. It's incredible. You have to read it. Um, so, so yeah, there are plenty of options, but use that URL and then make sure that you're constantly directing your audience to visit it. Um, how do I respond to my inner critic? <laughs> Isn't that the ultimate uh, artist question right there? Um, you know, I'm older, so I've had, I've had my critique days in school. Um, I've had mentors in the art world. Um, so I've had my critiques there. I have an artist group that I'm, well, this year makes me sad we haven't met that much that we meet with regularly and we critique our work. Um, and so the only time I guess I'm really critical, you know, is, is a career measurer. Um, I, I study art, I'm on Artsy every day, spending time researching the art world, pricing, who's hot, who's not, what galleries are selling work, who's going where, what artists are moving, what new curators are exploding. And then I measure myself and my work within those that fit into my, my, my genre and the art world or my niche. So if you research art and where and how you create, you can find all the artists that are similar to you, that are better than you, that aren't as good as you, what they're doing, where they're showing, how they're pricing their work. And I keep lists of that stuff. Um, and that's the only time I really get critical of myself if I think, oh, I can't believe they just got that show or that gallery. Oh, I feel like their work's really weak right now. You know, and, and that's being an artist. Like you're gonna look at other people's work and you're gonna walk into museums and galleries and you're gonna go, really? Oh, but I've learned to go, I've got a lot more work to do. Instead of judging others' work and thinking negatively about myself and my work, I walk in and I go, I've got a lot of work to do. It's time to get in the studio. And so Kurt, how much time do I spend on social media versus creating art, including video editing and such? Well, when I'm creating art, paint has to dry. So I'll sit down in the studio while paint's drying and I'll get on and look, answer some comments. I try to do it. I post at noon every day when I post because that seems to be the time that I have the most engagement. Um, so I usually put my posts up at noon and that's all I do. And then at night I'll go through comments or while paint's drying, I'll go through comments. If I'm editing, um, obviously that takes a little more time. So I may not go in the studio a day I'm editing. I may just be editing uh, video, um, which for me is also a great way to watch what I'm actually doing in the studio when I'm editing video. And I may have questions, ooh, don't really like that brush stroke at all. Why did I do that? Oh, I was using my six foot brush handle rather than being up close with just a regular handheld brush on the paper, the canvas. So um, it's still studio, even though I'm editing. Have I ever, no, I've never used advertisements on IG or Facebook. Am I against it? Not at all. It's an option. Um, some people, some audiences may look at it and go, really? Are you really trying to force your stuff on me? And other people will follow. So I think that's, you know, I think that's a personal decision. I've done it for brands uh, like crazy. I know how to do it well, but I've never, I just have never wanted to give Facebook or Instagram any more of my money. <laughs> um, time lapse. Sure. You can use time lapse. Um, gimmicks. I would say do whatever you want. Um, as a filmmaker myself, I truly think you have to think of a broad audience. You have younger people, you have middle-aged people, and you have older people. I have a lot of older generations that follow me on Instagram and time-lapse, they have a really hard time with. It's just tough. 
it's so fast, colors are changing, movement. And so the reason I use time lapse primarily is because I'm putting a week, two weeks worth of painting into one little, you know, one to two minute video on Instagram. Um, now on YouTube, I had a lot of people ask if I would put up my entire session of painting. <laughs> and so I've edited some pieces down to two hours um, using clips from days so that they have a full, you know, regular motion and they, cause they wanted to go in and see how I was doing things. Cause you know what, if they want to steal it, steal it. And honestly, when somebody steals your ideas or your things, that should feel pretty good. That should feel pretty good to you as an artist. Cause there are people that rip things off and there are people that steal to make themselves better and they adapt it to their own work. Um, which we talked about a little bit. So, um, okay. Um, yeah. we are a little bit over time, so I'm going to kind of get us wrapped up. I yep. have put a link in the chat. I'm going to put it again. Um, we have a, whoops, to everyone, please, not to just one person. There we go. Um, it would be great if you guys could get on and um, fill it out. Uh, we are getting ready to uh, schedule all of our workshops for spring. Um, and so there's a question in that survey of what you would like to see. And so we definitely want to get feedback on that. Um, if you have more questions for Ty, like he said, you can certainly reach out to him on social media or his website. Um, I think that that might be it. Again, um, austintexas.gov slash artist resource center is our, our web page where all of our resources for these workshops and all of our classes. Um, there are links to um, previous workshops that we've recorded or the presentations that go along with them when we've done them in person. Um, we did record tonight, so I will work on getting this um, put together and we do have a, a YouTube channel for the Artist Resource Center um, and we'll get it put on that as well as it looks like it did successfully stream to Facebook. So you should be able to watch it on our Doherty Art Center Facebook as well if you missed part of it or came in late. So um, I want to thank Ty so much for um, sharing his experiences and insights into social media. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you guys. This is a blast. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, oh wow, time went fast. I didn't even think it went that fast. Well, I'm glad. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate you. I appreciate everything you guys do for the city. Your team is amazing. You guys have always done so much. I've had so many friends that have had phenomenal shows um, with you guys and hung incredible work downtown through you guys. So, uh, wow, you're an inspiration to the city art wise and uh, should not go unnoticed how difficult this time is for you all as individuals and as an organization. So thank you for continuing to provide just uh, a wealth of knowledge and inspiration to, uh, to not only Austin, but the rest of us around Texas too, that, uh, that know everything you're about. Thanks so much. Yes, we've, we've been trying and we're going to continue to try and this will certainly, um, virtually probably maintain even when we are safely back in person. So um, again, thank you so much, Ty. Um, thank you everybody else for coming and joining us tonight and, and listening to us. And we hope you'll join us again in the future for a workshop or a class or any other event that we have. Um, so thank you again, everyone, and have a good night. See you, everybody.